So you've spoken a lot about the idea of software 2.0. Mm. Um, all good ideas become like cliches so quickly. Like the terms, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious. Um, it's like, I think Eminem once said that like, if he gets annoyed by a song he's written very quickly, that means it's going to be a big hit because mm. it's, it's too catchy. Mm. But uh, can you describe this idea and how your thinking about it has evolved over the months and years since since you coined it? Yeah. Yeah, so I had a blog post on Software 2.0, I think several years ago now. Um, and the reason I wrote that post is because I kept, I kind of saw something remarkable happening in like software development and how a lot of code was being transitioned to be written not in sort of like C++ and so on, but it's written in the weights of a neural net. Mm -hmm. Basically just saying that neural nets are taking over software, the realm of software, and um, taking more and more and more tasks. And at the time, I think not many people understood uh, this uh, deeply enough, that this is a big deal, this is a big transition. Uh, neural networks were seen as one of multiple classification algorithms you might use for your data set problem on Kaggle. Like, this is not that. This is a change in how we program computers. And uh, I saw neural nets as uh, this is going to take over. Uh, the way we program computers is going to change. It's not going to be people writing a software in C++ or something like that and directly programming the software. It's going to be accumulating uh, training sets and data sets and crafting these objectives by which we train these neural nets. And at some point, there's going to be a compilation process from the data sets and the objective and the architecture specification into the binary, which is really just uh, the neural net uh, you know, weights and the forward pass of the neural net. And then you can deploy that binary. And so I was talking about that sort of transition. And uh, that's what the post is about. And I saw this sort of play out in a lot of uh, fields, uh, you know, autopilot, autopilot being one of them, but also just uh, simple image classification. People thought originally you know, in the 80s and so on, that they would write the algorithm for detecting a dog in an image. And they had all these ideas about how the brain does it. And first we detect corners and then we detect lines and then we stitch them up. And they were like really going at it. They were like thinking about how they're going to write the algorithm. And this is not the way you build it. <laughs> um, and there was a smooth transition where, okay, uh, first we thought we were going to build everything. Then we were building the features uh, so like hog features and things like that, uh, that detect these little statistical patterns from image patches. And then there was a little bit of uh, learning on top of it, like a support vector machine or binary classifier uh, for cat versus dog and images on top of the features. So we wrote the features, but we trained the last layer, sort of the, the classifier. And then people are like, actually, let's not even design the features because we can't. Honestly, we're not very good at it. So let's also learn the features. And then you end up with basically a convolutional neural net where you're learning most of it. You're just specifying the architecture. And it, the architecture has tons of uh, fill-in blanks, which is all the knobs. And you let the optimization write most of it. And so this transition is happening across the industry everywhere. And uh, suddenly, we end up with a ton of code that is written in neural net weights. And I was just pointing out that the analogy is actually pretty strong. And we have a lot of uh, developer environments for software 1.0, like we have uh, IDEs, um, how you work with code, how you debug code, how do you, how do you run code, uh, how do you maintain code. We have GitHub. So I was trying to make those analogies in the new realm. Like, what is the GitHub of software 2.0? Turns out it's something that looks like Hugging Face right now. Uh, <laughs> you know. And so I think some people took it seriously and built cool companies. And uh, many people originally attacked the post. It actually was not well received when I wrote it. Mm. And I think maybe it has something to do with the title. But the post was not well received. And I think more people sort of have been coming around to it over time. Yeah. So you were the director of AI at Tesla, where I think this idea was really implemented at scale, which is how you have engineering teams doing software 2.0. So can you sort of linger on that idea of, I think we're in the really early stages of everything you just said, which is like GitHub IDEs. Like how, how do we build engineering teams that that work in software 2.0 systems and and the, the the data collection and the data annotation, which is all part of that software 2.0. Like, what do you think is the task of programming a software 2.0? Is it debugging in the space of hyperparameters, or is it also debugging in the space of data? Yeah, the way by which you program the computer and influence its algorithm is not by writing the commands yourself. You're changing mostly the data set. Uh, you're changing the um, 
loss functions of like what the neural net is trying to do, how it's trying to predict things. But yeah, basically the data sets and the architectures of the neural net. And um, um, so in the case of the autopilot, a lot of the data sets had to do with, for example, detection of objects and lane line markings and traffic lights and so on. So you accumulate massive data sets of, here's an example, here's the desired label. And then uh, here's roughly how the architect here's roughly what the algorithm should look like. And that's a convolutional neural net. So the specification of the architecture is like a hint as to what the algorithm should roughly look like. And then the fill in the blanks uh, process of optimization is, uh, is the training process. And then you take your neural net that was trained, it gives all the right answers on your data set and you deploy it. So there's, in that case, perhaps at all machine learning cases, there's a lot of tasks. So is coming up, formulating a task like a, for a multi-headed neural network, is formulating a task part of the programming? Yeah, how very you, much so. How you break down a problem yeah. into a set of tasks. Yeah. I mean, on a high level, I would say, if you look at the software running in in the autopilot, I gave a number of talks on this topic. I would say, originally, a lot of it was written in software 1.0. There's, imagine, lots of C++, all uh, right? And then, uh, gradually, there was a tiny neural net that was, for example, predicting, given a single image, is there like a traffic light or not, or is there a lane line marking or not? And this neural net didn't have uh, too much to do in, this, in the scope of the software. It was making tiny predictions on individual little image. And then the rest of the system stitched it up. So, okay, we're actually, we don't have just a single camera, we have eight cameras. We actually have eight cameras over time. And so what do you do with these predictions? How do you put them together? How do you do the fusion of all that information? And how do you act on it? All of that was written by humans um, in C++. And then we decided, okay, we don't actually want uh, to do all of that fusion in the C++ code because we're actually not good enough to write that algorithm. Mm -hmm. We want the neural nets to write the algorithm. And we want to port uh, all of that software into the 2.0 stack. Mm -hmm. And so then we actually had neural nets that now take all the eight camera images simultaneously and make predictions for all of that. Uh, so, um, and, and, it's, and actually they don't make predictions in the, in the space of images. They now make predictions directly in 3D. Mm -hmm. And actually, they don't uh, in three dimensions around the car. And now, actually, we don't um, manually fuse the predictions over t in 3D over time. We don't trust ourselves to write that tracker. So actually, we give the neural net uh, the information over time. So it takes these videos now and makes those predictions. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of just like putting more and more power into the neural net, more and more processing. And at the end of it, the eventual sort of goal is to have most of the software potentially be in the 2.0 land. Um, because it works significantly better. Humans are just not very good at writing software, basically. So the prediction is space, uh, happening in this like 4D land yeah. with three-dimensional world over time. Yeah. How do you do annotation in that world? What, what, what have you, as, so, so data annotation, whether it's self-supervised or manual by humans is, um, is, is a big part of this software yeah. 2.0 world. Right. I would say by far in the industry, if you're like talking about the industry and how, what is the technology of what we have available, everything is supervised learning. So you need a data sets of input, desired output, and you need lots of it. And um, there are three properties of it that you need. You need it to be very large. You need it to be accurate, no mistakes, and you need it to be diverse. You don't want to uh, just have a lot of correct examples of one thing. You need to really cover the space of possibility as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And the more you can cover the space of possible inputs, the better the algorithm will work at the end. Now, once you have really good data sets that you're collecting, curating, um, and cleaning, you can train uh, your neural net um, on top of that. So a lot of the work goes into cleaning those data sets. Now, as you pointed out, it's probably, it could be, the question is, how do you achieve a ton of, uh, if you want to basically predict in 3D, you need data in 3D to back that up. Mm -hmm. So in this video, we have eight videos coming from all the cameras of the system. And uh, this is what they saw. And this is the truth of what actually was around. There was this car, there was this car, this car. These are the lane line markings. This is the geometry of the road. There's a traffic light in this three-dimensional position. You need the ground truth. Um, and so the big question that the team was solving, of course, is how do, you, how do you arrive at that ground truth? Because once you have a million of it, and it's large, clean, and diverse, then training a neural net on it works extremely well, and you can mm -hmm. ship that into the car. And uh, so there's many mechanisms by which we collected that uh, training data. Uh, you can always go for human annotation. You can go for simulation as a source of ground truth. You can also go for what we call the offline tracker um, that we've spoken about at the AI day and so on, mm -hmm. which is basically an automatic reconstruction process for taking those videos and uh, recovering the three-dimensional 
sort of reality of what was around that car. So basically think of doing like a three-dimensional reconstruction as an offline thing, and then uh, understanding that, okay, there's 10 seconds of video, this is what we saw, and therefore here's all the lane lines, cars, and so on. And then once you have that annotation, you can train your neural net to imitate it. And how difficult is the reconstru- the 3D reconstruction? It's difficult, <laughs> but it can be done. So there, so the, there's overlap between the cameras and you do the reconstruction and there's, uh, yes. perhaps if there's any inaccuracy, so that's caught in the annotation step. Uh, yes, the nice thing about the annotation is that it is fully offline. You have infinite time. Mm-hmm. You have a chunk of one minute and you're trying to just offline in a supercomputer somewhere, figure out where were the positions of all the cars, of all the people. And you have your full one minute of video from all the angles and you can run all the neural nets you want and they can be very efficient, massive neural nets. There can be neural nets that can't even run in the car later at test time. So they can be even more powerful neural nets than what you can eventually deploy. So you can do anything you want, three-dimensional reconstruction, neural nets, uh, anything you want just to recover that truth. And then you supervise that truth. 